Hi everyone, my name is Kuvina, and welcome to Relativity Part 4. This episode is about length contraction. This video will build upon the previous sections, so it's recommended that you watch those first, but it's not necessarily required. The most important thing so far is the list of rules which you can see on screen right now. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's get into it. So length contraction is one of the most famous relativistic effects, right up there with time dilation. To put it simply, as an object moves faster, its length is shortened or contracted along the direction of motion. And if you switch over to that object's reference frame, then it's everything else that's contracted, and this includes not only objects themselves, but also the empty space between them. Similar to time dilation, you might hear this and think it must be some kind of illusion, but no, the object literally does get shorter. So that raises the question, why does this happen and how does this happen? Well, we're going to derive an equation for it using the following situation. Imagine there are two observers, stayer and mover. The stayer stays on Earth, and the mover takes off in a spaceship at velocity v. This time, though, there's actually a destination. We'll just say it's a star some distance away, and we'll represent this distance with the variables. ls is the distance in the stayer's reference frame, and lm is the distance in the mover's reference frame. So how long does it take for the mover to arrive? Well, it actually depends on your reference frame because of time dilation. Time passes at different rates for the two observers, so we'll use TS for time taken in the stayer's reference frame, and TM for time taken in the mover's reference frame. Now we have all the variables we need to form equations. We'll start in the stayer's perspective. So in this reference frame, the mover travels at velocity v, the distance covered is ls, and the time it takes to get there is TS. Velocity is distance over time, so v equals ls over ts. But what about the other reference frame? Well, in the mover's perspective, it's not the mover moving towards the star, it's actually the star that's moving towards them at velocity v. This doesn't matter though, because the distance traveled is still going to be lm. This time, the time taken is tm, and again, velocity is distance over time, so we get v equals lm over tm. Then we can combine the two equations by substituting one into the other. We can then multiply by tm and divide by ls to get tm over ts equals lm over ls. This equation has a really nice intuitive interpretation. The ratio of the distances is the same as the ratio of the times. And now we can take into account the time dilation equation. If you divide by ts, then it tells you the ratio between the times is just square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared also known as the Lorentz factor inverse, also known as alpha. And we know the ratio of the distances is the same thing, so we replace tm over ts with lm over ls. Then if we multiply by ls, we get an equation for length contraction that tells you lm in terms of ls. As you can see, it's exactly the same as the time dilation equation, but with distances instead of times. In other words, in the mover's perspective, the time it takes to reach the star is shortened by some amount but the distance to the star is also shortened by the same amount, so the velocity remains the same as before. But this isn't how I introduced length contraction. The way I introduced it was that the length of objects is shortened, but what I've just shown is the distance between objects getting shortened. So how do we relate these ideas? Well, first you have to realize that length contraction is uniform along the direction of motion. According to the formula, distance is just scaled by a number alpha, and alpha does not depend on distance. So if you have a series of stars at evenly spaced intervals of L, then their distances will all get multiplied by the same number alpha, so they'll still be evenly spaced. And you can see how this idea extends infinitely in both directions and also works on any scale. Now why is this useful? Well, what I like to do is imagine a cosmic ruler measuring the distance from Earth to the star. If that distance is contracted, then the cosmic ruler should also get contracted by the same amount. Since length contraction happens uniformly, every segment of the ruler is also contracted by that same amount. If those segments are measuring something, then that object is contracted by the same amount as well, and this also applies to the star and the Earth. So the length of objects and distances between them get contracted in the same way, and we can use the same equation. 
Now, this equation represents the situation with two observers who each measure the length of some object, and the object is stationary to the stayer, and the mover moves at velocity v. Lm and Ls are the length of that object according to each observer. But this isn't my preferred formula. Instead, I would use the equation Lc equals L0 times square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So what's the difference, and how do we get this equation? Well, if you examine the situation carefully, you might notice that a stayer is actually completely unnecessary. Since the object and the stayer have the same velocity, it means that the object's length in the stayer's reference frame is the same as the object's length in its own reference frame. This is what's known as the object's proper length, and we denote it with L0. If you're given the length of an object without a specified reference frame, then it's safe to assume it's meant to be the proper length. So my equation replaces Ls with L0. It also replaces Lm with Lc for contracted length. And this way, we don't need to worry about who's the mover or stayer. So it results in the formula Lc equals L0 times square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And we'll add it to the list of rules as number 5. The cool thing about this equation is that it shows how length contraction and time dilation are similar, but also have differences. With time dilation, each observer sees themselves as a stayer and applies the equation like this. Ts is my age according to me, and Tm is their age according to me. With length contraction, the object being measured applies it like this. L0 is my length according to me, and Lc is my length according to them. And the observer applies it like this. L0 is their length according to them, and LC is their length according to me. So now when we apply this line of thinking to the situation from earlier, it's clear to see that each observer will see the other one get length contracted. The mover will also see Earth, the star, and the distance from Earth to the star get length contracted. It's kind of weird to say that empty space gets shorter, but I think it's easier if you imagine the cosmic ruler getting shorter, and the empty space gets shorter by the same amount. Now let's look at a real life example. So Earth is constantly bombarded by cosmic rays. These are high energy particles that travel through space at extremely fast velocities, like 0.997 c. When they reach Earth, they collide with particles in the atmosphere. This creates secondary cosmic rays, which move just as fast, but are made of newly created particles, including muons. A muon is a type of fundamental particle that's basically like an electron, but 207 times heavier. Muons are unstable, and they decay into electrons right after they're created with half-life of only 1.523 microseconds. So let's say you have a detector that finds muons moving directly downwards. At an elevation of 2.3 kilometers, it detects 400 muons per hour. So what would you expect to find at sea level? Well, you know it's going to be less than before, since the muons decay as they move downwards, so not as many remain the farther down you go. To calculate the expected number, we need to determine what fraction of those will decay to electrons as they cover 2.3 kilometers. That's the same as 2300 meters, and their velocity 0.997c is about 299 million meters per second so the time it takes is 7.7 .7 microseconds. Dividing this by the half-life, we find that it's approximately five half-lives, so the number of muons gets cut in half five times, which leaves only 3% of them remaining. Therefore, you might expect to detect 12 muons per hour. But in practice, the detector actually finds 305 muons per hour, 76% of the original amount. So how do this many of them survive the trip? Well, the answer is, of course, relativity. Since the muons are moving so fast, they experience time dilation. So even if it's 7.7 .7 microseconds in your reference frame, the muons are aging slowly, so it's less time for them. Using the formula, you can see that 7.67 .7 microseconds to you is only 0.59 microseconds to them. This is less than a half-life, so it makes sense that most of them are still there. And if we form an exponential decay function, then the prediction matches with the results. But what about from the muons' perspectives? Well, the way they see it, the Earth is moving, so it undergoes length contraction. 
So what we see as 2.3 kilometers, they see as only 178 meters, according to the length contraction formula. The time it takes to clear this distance is exactly what we got before, so again, we expect that 76% of them should still be muons. So no matter which reference frame we use, we get the same result. It's just that in our reference frame, it's caused by time dilation, but for the muons themselves, it's caused by length contraction. This shows how the two phenomena are really just two sides of the same coin. And it's actually the same idea that shows the connection between electricity and magnetism, but that's a story for another time. And now I just want to clarify a few things about length contraction. First of all, the object doesn't have to be moving directly away from you for its length to be contracted. If it's moving towards you, or even if it's moving past you, it will still be contracted the same way. It's not the position that matters, only the velocity. Secondly, length contraction only happens along the direction of motion. If a 1 meter long cube is moving at 0.8c, then it won't stay a cube. Instead, it will become a 1 by 1 by 0.6 meter square prism. At least that's what happens if its movement is axis aligned. But depending on the direction, you can get all sorts of interesting shapes. Likewise, a sphere would become an oblate spheroid. So objects get contracted parallel to the direction of motion, but not perpendicular to it. How do we know this, though? Why don't objects get contracted in both directions? It doesn't sound out of the question, right? Well, we can actually disprove this type of length contraction by contradiction. We start by assuming that objects do get contracted this way. Let's just say, by the same amount, the Lorentz factor inverse. Now, imagine you have a sheet of glass with a hole in it 9 centimeters in diameter. You also have a ball with diameter of 10 centimeters. Normally, this is too big to fit, but if you threw the ball at 0.8c, then according to our assumption, it would remain a sphere, and its diameter would become 6 centimeters, which is small enough to fit through. That was in the glass's perspective, but now let's look at the ball's perspective. It sees itself as 10 centimeters, since that's its proper length, but it sees the glass moving towards it at 0.8c, which means according to our assumption, the diameter of the hole becomes 5.4 centimeters. This is way too small for the ball to pass through, so instead it will end up shattering the glass. So in the ball's reference frame, the glass shatters, but in the glass's own reference frame, it doesn't shatter. You can't have an event that happens in some reference frame, but not in others. So this scenario is impossible, making it a contradiction. Since the assumption of perpendicular length contraction led to it, that must be false as well. And that's how we know length contraction is only in the parallel direction. But hold up a minute. Couldn't we use the same logic to disprove length contraction in the parallel direction as well? Imagine an 11 meter ladder passing through a 10 meter shed. Usually it can't fit, but if it travels at 0.6c, the ladder's length is contracted to 8.8 .8 meters so it fits. In the ladder's own perspective though, the shed moves at 0.6c, so its length becomes 8 meters, but the ladder is still 11 meters and no longer fits. So again, in one reference frame it fits, but in the other one it doesn't. This seems like another contradiction, so that would mean length contraction can't be true. But here's the thing. Length contraction was a consequence of time dilation. You can't have one without the other, and we've seen the evidence for time dilation, so that can only mean one thing. This situation is not a contradiction, only an apparent contradiction. And as it turns out, this is the second most famous paradox in relativity, the latter paradox. In the next episode, we'll examine the situation in more detail, and see what makes it different than the case with the glass breaking. For now though, just know the key difference is that with the glass shattering, it was an event that happened in one reference frame, but not in another. With the latter though, you'll never get anything like that. And to see why, you have to redefine what it means for the latter to fit and then apply relativity of simultaneity. Anyway, with that we've reached the end of the video. If you think this was a good explanation of length contraction, then consider liking the video, because it means more people will see it. Also, subscribe for part 5, and for more math and science videos. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon. Bye!